Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Our text for the sixth Sunday of Easter, which falls on May 5th, 2024, is Acts 10, verses 44 through 48, Psalm 98. 1 John, we continue with chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Our gospel lesson is John chapter 15, 9 through 17. It's the second vine reading, or as Caroline has told us, the vine and the branches. The vine and the branches discourse. <laughs> you just want to coin a new title for something in the Bible. Kinda. It should catch yeah. on. <laughs> you can have biblical studies immortality if you That's right. We'll see if it we'll, we'll see if it catches on. But my point in that, of course, was to, I mean, this is one of the homiletical challenges of John, is that Jesus seems to be repeating himself. And since we are in year B, we'll get the same thing coming up with the Bread of Life discourse, where it's like, how many times can Jesus talk about being the Bread of Life? But... If we are attentive, there's the there's these just little nuances that he makes that that invite us deeper into the image, and that's what we get here. And uh, and now we're again abiding uh, abiding in his love, and so uh, there's a it's almost imperceptible, but that's the key. I think the key for the John discourses is. Uh, what Jesus has to offer can't be said in one sentence <laughs> or two or five. And that, explains, and that explains all our denominational differences. Yeah. Because we can't go. capture the idea in one setting. Yeah, exactly. But it's, it's a, it is also a narrative way to underscore the abundance and so it's not it's not just that Jesus can't say it in one sentence it's just a, it's impossible like the like this like the gospel ends right and so which i think is i think is also an invitation for us to imagine yeah what would we you know what would we say about it as well so anyway that's why i called it the vine and the branches discourse you know, for all of that complexity or all of the repetition or all of the way it spirals on itself and maybe with each lap takes a different look, you know, and mm -hmm. there still is something remarkably simple about verses, especially like 12 through 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In that there's just not a lot of theological complexity that needs people like us to unpack, you don't need to run to a theologian mm -hmm. or something to understand what he's talking about here. Um, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Mm -hmm. and my friends of you do what I command you and, and so on. I've made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. Well, that sounds really big and dramatic that must contain volumes and volumes of information, but it's not. It's this promise of well, I use the word I brought up a couple of weeks ago, belonging. It's this, it's this promise of abiding. It's this promise of a relationship. What's the key to that relationship or what's the hallmark of that relationship? It's love, which I'm not saying is easy to do, but it's remarkably easy to conceptualize and understand mm -hmm. what it might look like in a given situation. See what I mean? There's something about all of this that given all of the, the ways in which we might approach the Easter season, with a whole lot of big ideas, here's the call, right? Here's the call to belonging to Jesus. Here's the call to what does it mean to imitate Jesus in his life, ministry, death, and even the resurrection and ascension, right? Which I think for John are also acts of love, or at least making the love that Jesus shares. See, I'm making it too complicated now, but making that love, making that intimacy now available uh, to us. So that's where I would go if I were preaching on this. I would just say, Finally, at the end of the day, we're a community that's been shown what love looks like. We've been empowered to love and we've been called to love. Then we sing a hymn. Yes. <laughs> Simplicity um, does not mean simple or even ease. Uh, yeah. ease, right? It's our, I guess it's, it's, it, you know, it's what we do is to try to explain what needs explaining. And 
I think what I'd like to invite folks to attend to is that what is the longing of us all? What, it, what, 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 what is it that we ultimately long for most, for most of us? And it is your word, Matt, it is to belong. And this is the promise of God that we do belong. Uh, this is the work of the Spirit that binds us together. This is what is demonstrated in the life and teachings of Jesus, that we become this community of witnesses to bring together these ideas that we've been talking about the last few weeks, particularly the expansiveness of this community um, as, as we think about going into all the world with this love of God. And um, what is it that we passionately long for? Love. Where is this love made real? In the God made known in Jesus. And that's why we are part of this community. I think, too, yes, both of you, I, I agree with that. And and as I talked about in the commentary, it's it's love that is not an abstraction, but has been embodied in Jesus. And then how is it that by loving one another, the disciples are are taking that embodied love of Jesus um, and sharing that with each other. I mean, it's just not, uh, it's not, it, again, it's not an abstraction. It's embodied. It's incarnated love. They've seen, experienced incarnated love. And so what difference does that make too, uh, that love is not, love is not uh, just I love you, but it's it's embodied in how we are and who we are and, and and all of that. I think too, the introduction here of I do not I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. You know, the fundamental, I mean, friend simply means loved one. It's just a different verb, phileo, right? So it's so a love, love is it means loved one. And I think that would be another direction I might take in that. Where, how is it that the places where we want to experience love, we haven't, uh, the expectations of certain relationships that should provide love that don't. And then where are those, where are those relationships where that love is really borne out? And, and, and the article that I quoted in the in the commentary, does a, a wonderful job of talking about friendship in the ancient world, particularly as a social construct that that when familial or other kinds of social contracts are not at work, and and I'm not saying you should preach a sermon on the ancient societal understandings of social contractual you know relationships, but I am saying that I, it could in it could. It could help people imagine where is it that where is it that they are experiencing this kind of embodied love, uh, and and where is it that they see that in friends? And I was uh, I, I was speaking with a church a couple of a uh, couple of weeks ago on the farewell discourse and how the farewell discourse helps us navigate grief and loss in particular. And one of the concepts when it when it came to this chapter that I lifted up was friendship. Mm -hmm. And how is it that friendship upholds you and sustains you in grief and loss? Mm -hmm. And um, where and how is it that we experience this, you know, deep, extraordinary love that again, that we might wish for other people, family, family members, for example, that we don't get and we get in a friend. And 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 that's I mean it's contextual for John in that the disciples are up against the realities of being rejected by family and being rejected by you know places where they would receive love. So it's not this is not just hypothetical, uh, but I think it invites this it invites some reflection too on our part to imagine that for um, for our listeners. Uh, I appreciate that and and where you ended in terms of the recognition that sometimes those um, once communities of belonging become the very source of being outcast, family, um, the social communities. Uh, because as you began, I was thinking 
with the question I raised of, you know, what is our passionate longing? The longing is to belong. And um, if we forget that, then our communities of faith stop being places that play praise God and simply become those places that affirm us. And we forget why this particular community exists. Um, and um, I might be getting ahead of us because that would actually lead us into uh, the Acts text in terms of what is it that began to happen and what begins to happen is praising of God, not just praise. But I'll hold off on that. We can go there. We can, we can cross that bridge. We can cross that bridge. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I, I just um, when you when you started that, I my mind just went, oh my goodness, that's 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 one the uh, risk that we take of having our churches become merely communities of belonging. Um, but when we remember that this community is to bear witness to God, then we see what happens when the people get together. And it is that God is named, that God is proclaimed, that God is witnessed to, and most of all, that God is acknowledged and praised. And um, in our post-theistic world, that that's risky. And some of our communities that we would know as communities of faith don't want to um, lift God up. I, I know when I was doing my, my uh, dissertation, um, one of the questions I asked, well, the questions I was asking was on preaching. And one of the answers I received that just struck a core with me was that um, you didn't have to know or believe in God to understand our pastor's sermons. And what they were responding to was whether or not the sermons mentioned God. And their response was not simply, mm, oops, no, it didn't. They went on to justify it to say, and that's a good thing, except for that's when the community simply becomes a gathering of like-minded people and not a community that results in the acknowledgement of the presence of the God who raised Jesus from the dead. Acts, yes? Yeah, it's, this is another tremendous story, although you wouldn't know it from just these couple of verses. You've really got to put it into a context, but mm -hmm. you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, not that hard. But yeah, this is, this is uh, I believe, the first Gentile who shows up in, in the book of Acts. And as Gentiles go, Cornelius is a pretty good one. <laughs> He's already uh, giving alms and praying and, and worshiping the God of Israel. He might be worshiping other gods too. We don't know, but he's he's uh, he's presented to us and he's recognized by the angel that that meets him as as doing well. So. It's not a hard conversion necessarily, you know, but so the, the, my point is, it's not like, look at this horrible person who now turns to Jesus, look in chapter nine for that with Saul, but with Cornelius, it's the question of, is this guy really one of us now <laughs> from the perspective of a Jewish church? And so the key thing is, yes, the spirits poured out. Yes, even on the Gentiles, but I think the key thing is is verse 48, then they invited him to stay for several days. In other words, Cornelius and his household invited Peter and Peter's associates mm. to stay for a couple of days. And that's where all of a sudden you realize, oh my goodness, this is about more than just sharing a message and moving on. This is about expanding the community, but it's also about transforming the community because now if Peter's gonna stay in his home, Peter's gonna eat the food that he serves, or at least be confronted with that question. Peter's going to be maybe surrounded by other household gods that would be probably in the home. All of these types of things that would appear to have been a very dangerous line to cross or even to get too close to. And so this is a story about Peter's conversion as much as it's about Cornelius's conversion, because Peter's discovering, I can be with these people. Peter might not be giving up his own commitment to dietary laws under the under Torah, but he can be with these people. He can share space with these people and everybody possesses the same spirit. I mean, this is just a tremendous mm -hmm. discovery that the church makes 
mm-hmm. in the first century that acts distills to this one story that that I think sets us on a trajectory where we are still discovering what else does the resurrection and ascension of Jesus make possible and the gift of the spirit make possible. Yeah. And I think too, with that is how, what you just described, Matt, which, which is the implications, right. Of they invited him to stay for several days. It really then expands uh, expands the without hindrance <laughs> mm-hmm. or the withholding, right? It's um, and uh, without hindrance, and the commentary does a great job of of talking about this um, this word, and that and that's how the how Acts even ends is without hindrance, and so it it gives this sense of what does that look like? You know what what does what does it mean to be in community in a community of Christ? Like you said, we don't know if Peter gave up his 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 you know requirements yeah. for for eating and such, but that but which would be a which could be a hindrance, and and you and you think about all the, the all the things that can be a hindrance that prevent us from communal uh, community and and being together and yet it's not so i think that would be a really i i think that would be a really meaningful direction to take in terms of what does what does um community in christ without hindrance really look like um and and the things that we the things that we would qualify as prevention or withholding or hindering are at the end of the day you know uh, don't really work. <laughs> um, so yeah, I really like that. Obviously too, this is um, in many ways looks ahead to Pentecost where part mm-hmm. of what's going on here is what does the, what has the spirit staged here with this meeting between Peter and Cornelius? What does the gift of the mm-hmm. spirit mean? Mm-hmm. And this is as far as Peter and his associates are concerned, as soon as they see evidence of the spirit in Cornelius, mm-hmm. they know their work is done. Yeah. We know that there is now no difference, no distinction. And that will also be acknowledged in chapter 11 when Peter goes back to Jerusalem and people don't say, what were you doing preaching to a Gentile? They say, why did you go to a Gentile's house and eat with us? Right. Like, what are you doing? And Peter didn't they says, ask- yeah, if God has cleansed, why should I? Anyway, go ahead. Uh, didn't they ask that about Jesus and the places he in these questions oh, yeah. Why you, yeah what is it about food in luke and acts and and the hospitality of table yeah yeah right right yeah. yep i think this is also the direction that we've taken i think this is where i would bring in psalm 98 i mean i would also just sing it because i was singing the lord a new song like this is a new song why don't we just it, yeah but why don't you just sing it uh instead of uh talk about it mm-hmm. but uh for god has done marvelous things and so uh that that and particularly what we've talked about with acts and what you've helped us see matt of that nothing nothing that happens is without the presence of the spirit and a recognition that this is god at work and and so we then sing um we sing about these marvelous things that that God has done and um uh, and it it I, I think this could be this could be a really uh i think this could be a, a great i i guess i want to say liturgically but it could be a, a great response to the sermon if that's the direction that you go that that there is no you know there's no there is no hindrance to what God can do. God has done marvelous things. And so it could be a confession, uh, after this, after, uh, my doorbell just rang, uh, it could be a confession after the sermon, or it could be a, uh, a, 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 just sing it as a, as a hymn of response. That's what I would do. And the expansion also fits with verse two, that he has revealed his vindication to the nations. So, yeah. 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 Plus just a great commentary from Clint McCann. Yeah. Psalm 98. If you just want to read that, it'll make you happy. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'll lift that up, but it, it, part of it too, I think reading, seeing that Psalm in response to a sermon on an Acts 10, 
can provoke, should provoke the question, what, like, what other ways are we training ourselves to look for God creating new possibilities mm -hmm. so that we don't just read the Cornelius story as a narrative remembrance of how the church decided to open its doors to Gentiles without Torah observance, mm -hmm. but again, that it sets the church on a track, so to speak, of get ready to find more ways in which right. the resurrection of Christ mm -hmm. should open up your understanding about belonging, to go back to that word, open up your understanding about connection, about um, qualifications or, or the lack thereof. So everyone who believes that Jesus is Christ has been born of God. That first John opening, that that ties in with this idea of uh, this gospel that goes to every nation, mm -hmm. everyone who believes. Absolutely. And then th that 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 is what this is about: is the recognition of God made known in Jesus, um, and it's somehow um, limited if we simply think of this as. Um, uh, I am. I have now been welcomed into a space that I was not welcomed into before. Well, how did this idea of letting the other in even become a possible imagination? Mm -hmm. It became a possibility because of the work of God made known in Jesus. And when we divorce that, when we divorce the belief in Jesus from the glimpse of good that we see, that we, what you just said is not going to happen. Um, Matt, you know, how do we continue this and not just make this a historical past? Well, if we think we can do this without God, if we think we can do this without Jesus, all it is is going to be a remembrance. Um, throughout history, when this becomes a marvelous thing, an unexpected reality, is when it is done because of Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. If I was feeling punchy this week, and looking at First John 5, I would think about looking to see if my church has, my congregation has any bylaws or any kind of written statements about what conditions do we have for membership. Mm. I would look to see what my denomination has. I know what my denomination has, but so I would, and I would just share those, but then I would also say, what are our unwritten ones, our unwritten expectations or conditions for membership? Mm -hmm. I know membership is in some ways an artificial thing, mm -hmm. but whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what are the ones that we have that we kind of presume? Like, if you're going to be a member here, we're going to need you to stop wearing that outfit, or we need you to stop doing that in the sanctuary, or we're going to need you to st start voting a different way. I mean, just kind of to think about the tacit things and just saying, what does it look like to open it up to believe that Jesus is the Christ, and who gets to decide even what that looks like or what that what that means? I'm laughing because uh, there's an old cartoon I used to use of uh, uh, first church somewhere, um, new member class, and the pastor has a pointer and the, the um, wall is scribbled with all of these rules. And the caption says, um, I know Jesus says that you uh, belong now, but we have a higher standard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and and what we get to in this passage is 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 a, a claim too about how you know how the world works, the expectations of the world, and then the expectations of faith and love in God, and and that 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 it's through this faith, not um, not to not not to you know pit. We are in the world, you know what I mean. Not to hit us, but there. What what are our um, as you were talking about joy? What are those? What are what are the world's criteria? And what are our criteria? And that that faith that that faith can claim this victory mm -hmm. of of God's love and God's presence and God's um, God's will for the world mm -hmm. and that sense that you get here of, and this is the victory, that victor is the world. That's not a verb, but it's the same verb. It's the same word. Uh, but, and who is it that conquers the world, um, but the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God. And so there's a sense too of, mm, um, 
I don't I, I don't want to I, I don't want to say authority or power, but there is kind of that that for me behind that, like that your faith gives you the that that power that mm-hmm. to be able to uh to be able to call that out or to be able to say, for whom do we stand and do we testify with the spirit about that or or not? Mm-hmm. Um, and so plus you can you can talk about Nike and what a brilliant Nikao, get it, you know, anyway, <laughs> but yeah, uh, you can like, you know, then teach everybody a Greek word and they'll be super excited about it. But, um, but anyway, that doesn't, that doesn't really preach, but it, that, uh, but the fact that our faith and, um, and, and, in what we believe and, and how that faith then becomes then the litmus test for, uh, for who's in and who's out and 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 pointing out the the presence of love yeah that's quite the ultimate victory <laughs> <laughs>